let's get started. Uh, we're happy today to have the, our friends from, from Dolt to come give a talk about the, the new data system that they've been building for a while. Uh, they've made some, uh, they show up on Hacker News quite a bit for being the GitHub for data. So uh, we have Oscar uh, Batori and Zach Musgrave and uh, engineers working at Dolt to come give a talk about how the system works. But so the way we'll do this is if you have any questions, uh, unmute yourself and just interrupt and, and you know, ask your question as we move along, but, but be sure to say who you are and where you're coming from so everyone knows who everyone is, okay? So with that, uh, Oscar, happy for you. Well, glad you're here, so go for it. Uh, well, thank you, Andy, appreciate it. Um, so, you know, first of all, thank you for having us. We're excited about Dalton, the work we've been doing, and um, excited to share it with a sort of, you know, esteemed group of uh, database enthusiasts and professional researchers. Um, uh, there we go, okay. So I'm going to give a two-part talk today. Um, right, did I? No. A two-part talk. Our motivations for building Dolt, um, the high-level design goals, um, considering these motivations, like what we want to do, and then I'll do a demo of the product. Um, and then I hand it over to Zach, and he's going to talk about Dolt's architecture and the core data structures, in particular, a novel data structure called Poly Trees, which we think are pretty interesting and have uh, governed some of the attention Andy cited and Hack and use. Um, so just quick background, uh, who we are, I'm Austin Vittori. Uh I am, in fact, not a software developer in my capacity at Liquidator. Um, I am a business development um, person, uh, but I previously was in, engin in engineering roles at BlackRock and Blue Mountain Capital uh, in sort of quantitative and systematic uh, strategies. Um, and I'll present the sort of motivations and the design goals and give a demo, and I'll hand it over to Zach, who's a senior software engineer, uh, he's previously at Google Cloud and Amazon, um, and he'll present sort of the some stuff about the architecture. Um, so with that, we'll jump right in. Uh, so I think it's helpful when you're discussing motivations, sort of get some of the backstory. Um, Liquidator is the company that builds Dolt. Uh, Dolt is an open source database. It's an Apache 2.0 license, um, so you know anyone can use it. Um, and Dolt Hub, which is uh, is a collaboration layer built on top of Dolt for hosting Dolt and uh, sharing data in the Dolt format. Um, and I think this sort of ter terminology of a format in the database is a little confusing, but it will become clearer as we jump into the talk and then the demo. Um, so the company was founded in mid-2018 and uh, the corporate mission statement was to uh, bring liquidity to the data market. So to actually make it easy to transfer data. Um, started out with specking a marketplace, uh, marketplace style features for data transfer. And they sort of realized that data transfer itself was the actual friction point. Um, it was, you know, the setup, uh, the technical infrastructure was actually the, the sort of limiting factor and building, you know, slick um, interfaces for exchanging legal information, signing documents and payments and all the other stuff that happens around that technical transaction um, was, could only take you so far. And if you wanted to really improve things, you needed to actually change the way data move from uh, in between organizations. So the kind of out of that realization came Dolt. And Dolt is a database that incorporates concepts from Git and um, relational databases. Um, it's sort of the motivations for the Git piece are sort of rooted in this idea of uh, reducing friction with regard to moving data around. So, you know, if you recall that prior to Git and GitHub, it was rather more difficult to obtain source code than running a single command, and sort of GitHub really changed that uh, super meaningfully, and it completely eliminated the uh, friction involved in obtaining code. Um, so we sort of wanted to draw inspiration from that technical story, um, and we also recognized that uh, SQL sort of is a common DDL, and like everyone understands it. And by everyone, I don't just mean people; I also mean like computers. Uh, there's just a vast ecosystem for managing. Uh, relational databases and expressing data in terms of uh, in terms of SQL. So we sort of wanted to bring these two concepts together um, to drive a sort of a new a database with a new set of goals. I think the main distinction is that, um, you know, relational databases, I think, uh, in, the, in some original sense are OLTP databases that optimize for a blend of read and writes uh, to the application backing stores. And I think that they've come to be used for a lot of things that are not application backing stores, that are more sort of uh, sources and sinks in ECL workflows. And so Dolt actually elevates a separate set of considerations um, around that. So 
To give you an example, uh, this example is drawn from my professional life. Um, you know, I used to work in systematic trading, um, which means we did a uh, model-based investments. Um, basically, you sort of create, create a model and then you map in some tradable securities. Um, and in order to do that, you often have to map from different ID spaces. So third-party vendors will give you information about the world, and then you will sort of map that information into tradable securities that you have sort of agreed with your clients you're allowed to trade. And um, this sort of presents a number of complications. Um, as you can see in the schematic, you're pulling in data from third-party vendors, you're ETL ETLing it into your own databases, you're then doing a bunch of transformations and overrides, and then you're sort of uh, using that data to drive your trading process. Um, it's you know, small data. In my experience, it was like 80,000 rows. Um, it's extremely valuable. Um, mistakes in mappings can lead to incorrect trades, and that can in turn lead to financial liability. Um, so it requires a ton of scrutiny uh, before anything sort of happens in production. Now, there's like multiple sources of error in this. You know, you can have an error come from your upstream vendor, you can have error in your SQL code, you can have error in your transformation and your overrides. Um, and so you sort of, if you want to build this on top of a relational database with the sort of last right wins architecture, you have to build all the application code around that. And if you want to expose telemetry into like what went wrong and where, you have to sort of think that through a priori. Um, and so what kind of ends up happening is that you be, you sort of try and build something clever. It doesn't quite work. I and mean, then you sort of have to have a human operator intervene anyway. That's at least that's what's happened in my, in my, in my experience. Um, so, you know, we, we like, I slaved away at this problem for two years. It was a consistent source of SLA misses in trading and um, you know, the, the sort of features we lacked was a database that sort of generated a data commit graph. Um, so we're going to sort of move forward and motivate this in context of using Dalt. Uh, so, you know, the way you would use Dalt here is every write would be a commit, right? And your, your data flow would generate an implicit commit graph. And then if any stage in your process went wrong, you would be able to immediately back into where, where that happened. So if the vendor introduced an erroneous result, you would be able to see in the diffs, you'd update it, you'd pull in an updated value from the vendor and you could roll back and rerun your process, generate a new commit, a new set of mappings, and then proceed with whatever downstream processes need to go forth. Um, and the sort of really important takeaway is that you don't need to write application code in order to achieve this. The database has native features that elevate the consideration of generating a set of commits associated with a set of rights. And so that's kind of the thing you do. So that's kind of like uh, an example of a problem we believe is underserved by the existing set of sort of database products and why we thought it was worth building new ones. Definitely not the only problem, but it's an example of something where a database with Dalt's core features can add value. So now sort of backing out of an example to sort of higher level design goals, I think there are three that are worth highlighting because uh, I, think, I think they very directly motivate the technical aspects of the talk that Zach will, of Dol, that Zach will talk about. So I think the thing we wanted most was a fully portable format. Um, you know, Git clone and Git pull, I think are really like inspiring. Um, I think they're just like, that's become the standard for distributing software. And I think that um, we, we wanted to push that a step further. So instead of just, you know, if you do git pull and you or git clone, you find some code, you still have to figure out how to run it. And, um, and that's fine, software is generally like that. Uh, we wanted to drop in a production database. And by that, we mean we wanted people to, or we wanted users to be able to clone data from Dolp Hub or some other remote run one command and then have a SQL server running. So I don't know if you were, came in early, Andy and Zach were discussing the nuances of the SQL server we run, but the idea is that anyone who finds a data set that's in Dolp format can clone that, immediately run it, and it will just wire into their infrastructure. And the schematic sort of illustrates that, right? You're using, using Dolp call to pull in updates, and you have a sort of on your own premises, you have a Dolp database running, and then you're able to either sync it to your existing database infrastructure or just wire into it via standard ODBC libraries that we know and love. And I think kind of like this is under kind of much more radical than it first seems. Um, you know, if you're talking about 
all the infrastructure that goes into maintaining data sets that like companies rely on and sort of drive business processes. Like, you know, you're talking about ripping out the, the ETL stuff, like the schemas, everything, and just cloning something into your, cloning the copy of something into your infrastructure and then subscribing to updates. And I think that's like a, a radical change in distribution coming back to our sort of mission statement for the company. Um, so I think we, the other thing we wanted to sort of bake into this is sort of tools for discipline collaboration. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at something like Uber and Lyft, they both use Envoy. Uh, Envoy was created by Lyft. And I think that would have been unthinkable 10 years ago. And the reason is, is because we now have tools that allow them to just outsource a piece of their infrastructure to something that the community of sort of Envoy contributors collectively owns. And I think that's sort of, it's a sort of cost benefit analysis where these two companies, even though they're mortal enemies, recognize neither of them is competing on how good their proxy is. And so they're able to sort of use these tools to like just drop in a piece of infrastructure that solves a problem that they, they have. And we're sort of in the dark ages of data collaboration uh, with companies often paying for data that could easily be maintained with the right tools. I mean, we had a, we had a, a CEO of a company uh, who emailed us telling us his entire industry is paying data brokers for lists of entities and they all have a shared interest in maintaining such a list, but they lack the means to do so. Um, so Dolt aims to kind of empower, com you know, entities that are interested in data sets to actually like, you know, take their destiny into their own hands and stop paying third parties. Um, and I think the distribution model that we highlighted, you know, this drop in infrastructure kind of really speaks to this, right? The ability to just drop that data set in as a resource into your, ecos your sort of local ecosystem. Um, so yeah. So the third, the third thing I want to highlight is data management primitives. I think this kind of goes back to um, the uh, the example of mapping tables. Uh, mapping tables are certainly something that you would want to manage. Uh, when I worked at BlackRock, someone once updated a mapping table, uh, and it uh, caused BlackRock to have to write like an eighteen million dollar check because we so, uh, what, traded what, the wrong. What, what's an example of a mapping table? Like entity resolution stuff. Yeah, so. Uh, uh, mapping table, yeah, that's a really good question. Sorry, that was maybe a little abstract. Um, so a mapping table would be like a uh, securities mapping table would be one one data vendor identifies securities in one ID space and another in another ID space, and then you trade in a third ID space. So like an ID space is just like a set of IDs to identify some objects in the world, right? In this case, securities, and then a mapping table just traverses the different ID spaces. It's, it's entity resolution. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So... We never referred to it that way, but that certainly sounds like the correct. Mapping tables is, is, is like, if, if you're actually in the trenches, entity resolution is like lofty ivory tower. Okay, there we <laughs> go. Um, so I very much spent my career in the trenches, but thank you for admitting me to the ivory tower this afternoon. Um, so, these, so you can think of these entity resolution tables, right, as being something that could, uh, they tend to be small and they tend to be maintained by humans, um, you know, Client mappings is one of them, where you map sort of database IDs to clients, so you sort of render the correct thing in the correct place for the correct client. Um, you don't want to render the wrong one. Uh, so there's a ton of, you know, there's generally data that configures code. Sort of, you know, code often exposes parameters, right? And these parameters end up determining a lot of the system behavior, and like, so they should be treated as such. And so I think that Dalt is a tool that sort of you know, exposes multiple interfaces for analysts and like domain experts to manage this stuff without having to get into the weeds. You know, we've, we've, got, a, we've got a Python API, we're gonna sort of do a Google Sheets integration, et cetera. We're gonna offer a wide variety of places for non-technical people to manage data, but allow them to make use of robust version control tools so they can, uh, they can sort of do this in a safe manner. So um, maybe this is, comes later in the slide, but like in your example here, you have a bunch of people making changes to the same data set. They push the sure. dolt. So yeah. what if, like, are you expecting them to be writing to the same branch, like to use Git semantics? Like how do you handle conflicts? Like what if somebody drops a column, the other guy adds a column, right? It's, it's yeah. one thing for code where actually a human can sit and, and, and decipher the conflicts and, and make sense of them. Sure. For this one, if I have a conflict on a billion records, you're kind of you're kind of shit out of luck, right? 
Can I, can I yeah. take this, Oscar? Yeah, go ahead, please. So, so this is this is a great question. I, I think it really speaks to the value proposition that Dolt has as a database product. Uh, you're you're exactly right. How is a human being supposed to make sense of millions of change rows? Uh, and the way it, the, our answer to this is the same way you make sense of any change in a database, you run queries. Uh, so in, in addition to the kind of sync and pull and merge and branch capabilities that Oscar has been talking about, Dolt actually makes it possible to query the diff of any two commits in the commit graph. So if I'm doing a merge and I have conflicts and I want to understand something about the, the rows that are in conflict, I can write a SQL select statement that selects from the rows of those two of the two different uh, table revisions that are in conflict only, right? So any any query any query that I want to analyze on the database database as a whole, I can also run that just on the subset of data that's changed, just on the subset of the data that's in conflict, etc. Right? So we really put the, the the power to understand the data in in whatever way you would normally using SQL. You can apply those same analytical analytical tools to your diff and merge uh, workflow. So actually, I think that Zach highlights a, a really exciting feature, which um, maybe I should have discuss, discussed when I was uh, talking about the mapping table example. You know, this, this idea of a data graph, right? When you're using a database that has, a, uh, has an underlying commit graph and you're associating each write with a commit, you can, and then the differences between those commits are themselves data. And, you know, if you want to build a workflow around that, Dolt exposes that data to you. You can build stuff on top of it. You can build dashboards that highlight differences, right? Just by writing SQL. Uh, there's no need to go, you know, endlessly writing code to highlight exceptions when your data doesn't meet certain criteria. You can literally just select straight from the commit graph. And, you know, we're committed as a sort of product, like ideal to expose as much of the commit graph in SQL as possible. So that, that sequence of, you know, updates is itself data, and it is fully exposed to the user. So I'm not, uh, I'm not questioning the, the again. The, I'm not questioning. Oh, should everything be SQL? I agree, it should be SQL. Right. I am. Um, I. I question whether the end user is capable of, of of making these kind of decisions, right? Like, people are stupid. A lot of people actually don't even write raw SQL. They go through Tableau, they go through MicroStrategy, or whatever. Right. So, like, I feel like you, you would almost need a DBA to be so the, the adult manager. I, I mean, again, you guys are getting you're running this. You know, people are running this now. So, you, you tell me whether the average you know data analyst can 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 deal with those those diffs. I I think um I think there's a an important distinction to be made, right? In the case of the example I'm giving here, just, you know, for by way of example, right? A mapping table is like inherently a small thing, right? It's okay. a thing humans maintain to configure their other systems, right? Sure. That is the kind of thing that a human can look at the diff, right? And we'll see examples where like you, you when I do a demo, I'll show you something where you, you can very realistically look at the diff, right? So then, and then there's other cases, right? Where you clearly would have to, look at the diff in some sort of programmatic way, right? You'd have to like write a query that summarizes it. Like, you know, if I changed all my portfolio weights in a portfolio table and it like, and the weights added up to more than one, then I know I'm in violation of some constraint, right? And I can have a SQL query to express that constraint at two different points in the commit graph. I, so, I, so, I, so, I, so I, I guess my comment is, and it's fine that this is the answer. I think the comment is that Unlike in Git, where like if it's a text file conflict or even like as you track changes in Word and put a better one, your off-brand average, you know, not really tech savvy person could probably handle that, can, can handle track changes. Then you, you, you need to be a little bit more sophisticated to handle a diff or conflict in, in Git. And it sounds like to me with, with, with Dolt, and I'm not saying this is a negative thing, it's just the way it is, that you have to be even more sophisticated to to handle the conflict. Yeah, I think I think I think that uh, an important thing to highlight is obviously most database interactions are automated, right? right. Yeah. So I think that a lot of these interactions will end up becoming scripted, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it won't be the case that someone's there like reviewing a billion line diffs. It will be someone has thought about a data process they want to engineer. And they have said, oh, well, like, here are the criteria under which I consider this a valid step. And like, let me script that. And oh, great, this Dolt exposes the commit graph via SQL. And ergo, I can express my 
desires in that query, right? And then build behaviors around that, right? Yes. I think that's a really exciting thing. Okay, yeah, I think, yeah, that makes sense, right? I'm I'm convinced. Like, again, most people don't get raw access to the database, but as you said, if it's part of the pipeline, if you automate it, okay, proceed, this is good. I actually, actually uh, the funny, funny thing you're, this is, as a DB, this is a funny anecdote, but in, in finance, uh, m- most people have access to the production database because the firms lack the uh, technical, they lack the discipline to actually do the work to expose proper hooks. So people end up having to update values manually all the time. So I'm gonna just do some like screen sharing stuff. Um, Okay, so you guys can see my terminal, right? Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, so I'm going to uh, dot clone something which I did earlier. So um, for context, this and I should probably actually show you this online before we. Let me, uh, so I just cloned some data, right? Uh, we talked about um, about kind of idolizing the git clone command and sort of as a distribution story. Uh, so when we, when I first started working at um, Liquidator, I sort of thought the 538 team had some cool data. So I went and, you know, uploaded a bunch of their data to Dolt Hub and then I, I set up some jobs that basically pulled the data uh, every, sort of periodically. Um, one kind of, um, interesting aspect of 538 is they're posting data, you know, every hour, every day, every week, however, whatever the update cadence of that data is, but there's actually no, um, and they'll, you know, they'll post a data set with like a before and after. So they're clearly interested in the changes in the values, but the, but they don't post a time series. They just post a snapshot of it. Right. So if you want to capture this data, you have to either sort of like write a program that transforms it into a sort of time series analysis, or you can just, use doll and you can just capture the commits. So with that, I went and took their polling data, which I find kind of interesting because politics, whatever. Um, and I uploaded it to doll hub. And so now we've run the clone command and we can just run dot SQL and, oh, sorry, no, I need to go into the polls directory. There we go. So I've cloned this repo and now run dot SQL and, uh, and now I've got a SQL shell and I've got some tables. Um, and now I'm, you know, if I'm interested in presidential approval ratings, uh, I know Marist College is the uh, sort of gold standard according to 538 for polling. Um, so I can sort of dump in and be like, get me all the um, president approval polls where pollster equals. Um, so now I have a bunch of, that's not very useful. Um, we can do describe. Presidential approval polls, um, and so now we've got some. You know, this is just a SQL database like any other. Um, but I think the exciting thing is that we ran one command and we acquired it, and now we can like just start running SQL on it. Uh, you know, I, I've read a bunch of tutorials about data analysis where they sort of advise you to set up a local SQL database, which took like you know fully half of the tutorial um, and involved importing CSVs. But this just lands on your desktop and it's running. Um, so you know, if we wanted to do a, um, if we wanted to do an update, we can sort of just express it in SQL. Um, president approval polls set. So suppose we decided um, that we think Marist College is now bad. Uh, it's no longer the gold standard, but it's in fact an F because we didn't like the polls. That sounds familiar. And then we can run that and we've now updated some stuff um, and we can uh, step out the SQL shell and we can run adult diff uh, and we're going to highlight the problem that uh, Andy uh, just so you know you can uh, widen this out you'll be able to see a bit more um, but you can see where we basically it's it's cell wise the diff so we're actually um, t- it turns out that like tables are a little easier to diff than um, the files because they are a little more structured um, so we can do like very accurate diffs. So, you know, here we've clearly just updated a bunch of rows, all the polls of Marist now have their FT rating set to F. And so we can, um, we can then, you know, oh, sorry. So with that one, I feel like you wanted to show the, just the primary key columns and not the whole thing. If they're, you know, if, if some of it, cause like, 
it's nice that it's color coded, but that's a, that's a shitload of data. <laughs> That's that's a very good comment. Something we should consider. Um, yeah, we. So if you go to, uh, let's see. I managed to kill my shell. Sorry. See, this is polls. Oh. I think it was just polls. Oh, it was polls. Oh, it was. Sorry. There we go. So yeah. Um, so if you look at the doll status now, we've updated the presidential approval ratings, and we can um, we can add it, we can uh, commit it, update it, Marist College to F, um, and then we can push it back to doll hub, um, and then we'll be able to use doll hub to view the view the diffs um, in a sort of friendly UI. Is your diff? Is it block based, or is it? Are you actually sending like column diffs? The, the the diff that Oscar is sending up with a push command is all block based. It's, it's, it, but 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 once once it hits some interface, either the SQL shell or Dolt Hub, that's when we kind of impose the column and row semantics on it. Yeah, but you had to ingest it, so your EC two network, uh, you know, your monthly fee is going to be ridiculous. Um, no, it's not that, it's not that, it's not as bad as you might think. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we do structural sharing to avoid ridiculous AWS fees in a minute. But I believe, at least in, on the ingestion, you don't need the whole row. You just need to like, again, an internal identifier, presumably you have a row ID, the column that you modified, ship that over the network. That's going to be a, a fraction of what you, what you just uploaded. Uh, we, that's a potential optimization due to the, how the current implementation works. That's not true. The smallest unit of diff that we can, that we can send or actually talk about in Dalt right now is a row. Uh, so even, even if you have only one column change, you're still going to revision the entire row and I'll, I'll get to why that is in the latter half of the talk. Okay. So, you know, um, you can, you can now see, although. These don't, this is a pretty wide table, which makes it quite hard to view in the terminal. But you can actually see, like on Dot Hub, that we really only highlighted the changed rows, and this is not that many rows of data, right? So you can very realistically imagine a human maintaining, you know, wanting to change seventy-two rows in a spreadsheet, um, and if the spreadsheet contains information that configures a system that could could blow them up financially, I think the value of data version control becomes pretty evident. Um, I think a, good, a place where this shines is like machine learning models. Um, you know, where pe people are using the stuff in production and it's configuring their system's behavior. And uh, I think having robust versioning on it is uh, important. I uh, like the idea of adding dash dash skinny and only showing the primary keys. We'll put, the, we'll put that on the future roadmap. That's an easy one. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. And, um, and Andy, there actually is, is a pretty easy ergonomic way that we, we have under development but haven't released yet, uh, where basically you, you write a, a SQL query and you could, so for example, you can say select star uh, or you know, select only the columns in this table that you care about and then give it two commit IDs, two commit hashes, and then it'll run the query and only show you the diffs between the results between those two commits. Um, there's also a bunch of fun system tables where you can uh, select, basically to run, run the same syntax as dolt diff, but from a SQL shell, there's a system table called dolt diff, the name of the table for every logical table where that you can select from directly to really slice and dice diffs however you want to. But that's kind of an advanced feature, so we didn't want to go into it too much. I mean, that, I, that's a UI. That's you guys, the dash dash skinny, that's easy. You guys can add that yep. easily. I'm more concerned about you guys giving more money to Amazon, right? Like, so whatever, you can send less data, <laughs> that's the way to do it. Exactly, yeah. Um, so I've, I've sort of uh, I've eaten up through a lot of time, um, and I think actually, uh, for this audience, that might have the, the more interesting content. So I'm just going to sort of now you know why we built Dalt and the problems we're trying to solve. Sort of, I will yield my time to uh, my esteemed yeah, colleague. This is, I mean, this is totally awesome because it's like, like I said, like it's this is not how we people normally think about relational databases. So I think this is helpful. Well, thank you very much, Oscar. We have, we, uh, to say we still have a half an hour. Yeah, I think we're I think we're doing a, doing okay here. Let's see. Okay, looks like my slide control works. Everyone can see my slides, I assume. Uh, I don't, if you came late and missed the announcement, please don't hold questions till the end.
just unmute your mic and speak up and I'll try to address questions as they come up. If it is something that's very involved, I'll punt you off to the end of the talk, but please ask questions as they occur to you. Um, so my name is Zach Musgrave. I'm a software engineer at Liquidata, the company that builds Dolt. I'm here to talk about the technical decisions we made when building this, this product uh, and the, the kind of trade-offs that they lead to and to discuss some interesting data structures that might be uh, interesting to people who are studying databases like yourselves. So when we think about the architecture of the Dolt database product, uh, I think of it as composed of three layers. So top to bottom here, there's a, actually let's go bottom to top. Uh, at, the very, at the very base layer, you've got a, a block store. There's a bunch of code that knows how to write and read blocks from disk in a particular way that is interesting for our use case. On top of that, we define a set of libraries and functions that build table and object and indexing semantics on top of that basic block store. And then on the very top, we have a SQL engine which is capable of inspecting those semantic objects and dipping down into the byte storage to retrieve rows, come up with query plans, execute them, et cetera. Uh, when we talk about the interfaces to Dolt, we also think of them in terms of these layers. So now top down, uh, if, you're if you're interacting with Dolt from a SQL perspective, you're gonna be talking to it in kind of one of two ways. You can do what Oscar just did in the demo and type Dolt SQL, and that brings you up into an interactive SQL shell that ships with the product. And you can run any standard SQL command and it, it ought to work. Um, if you don't want to do that, if you want to talk to your data through some other tool chain, if you want to use any of the hundreds of tools that talk SQL that have been invented since the 70s, then you type Dolt SQL Server. That starts up in a, a MySQL ser compatible SQL server that you can connect to with the MySQL client, with the MySQL workbench, with anything that speaks JDPC. Any program that speaks the MySQL binary protocol can connect to this thing, and uh, it'll pretend that it's an application data store like any other that you've ever connected to. Uh, so it literally is compatible to any, any product that, you, that talks to your database at all. If you're talking to one of the two bottom layers, if you're, if you're talking, uh, if you're editing the, the, if you're making commits against the, the Dolt repository itself or changing the, the schema, if you're trying to determine the, the diff between two different commits, then you're gonna be using one of the, the bottom two interfaces. Uh, and this is where we, the, the Dolt CLI and the Dolt Hub APIs come to play. Uh, Dolt Hub, which Oscar mentioned earlier, is the, the site that we built where you can share Dolt repositories. And these hook into the Dolt Hub hooks into APIs that we built that expose similar functionality to the Dolt CLI. So this is where if you're dealing with repositories as uh, a versioned object that you might want to collaborate with others on, you're going to be using these commands. So anytime I clone a repository, anytime I create a new branch, anytime I merge someone else's branches, changes into mine, resolve conflicts, etc., uh, I'm going to use the, the Dolt CLI natively and some commands there. We built this to be identical to Git. So if you're familiar with Git, then you already know all the commands you need for uh, to run Dolt. It's kind of a one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, I should also note that one of the strategic goals for the product is to make available in the SQL shell any command that you can run from the Dolt CLI. So creating a branch, cloning, forking, pushing, pulling, all those things will have na uh, SQL native equivalents so that you aren't tied to the command line. That's a, a goal of ours going forward. The technology that we built these on, uh, going from the bottom up again, uh, the byte storage and versioning use some pretty interesting data structures that we're gonna talk about in depth. It uses a Merkle DAG similar to how Git stores its data uh, and using a novel data structure called a proly tree. Uh, these are interesting because it gets us two things. One, it gives us uh, content addressing. So if we, if we have a particular piece of table information, uh, we can compare whether it's identical to another piece of table information just by examining its hash that's cryptographically verifiable. Uh, and second, it allows us to make small changes without blowing up the storage cost as we store all the revisions to these things. And again, we'll get into exactly why that's the case very shortly. On top of that, when we go to define the semantic objects that the database interacts with, the things like the tables, their schemas, indexes, foreign keys, etc., these are uh, Go libraries and routines that map onto this byte storage and interact with these with these block layer storage uh, interfaces. 
everything's basically maps of tuples and, and structs and stuff we'll get into. Then at the very top layer, we have the SQL query engine itself, which for most intents and purposes is totally separable from the product itself. Uh, and let's jump in there and get that part out of the way. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure Andy is going to be disappointed to hear this, but the SQL engine itself is not the primary focus of this talk. It is kind of separable. Uh, the way we provide a SQL interface to Dolt is this general purpose SQL query engine called Go My SQL Server. Uh, this was started by a now defunct organization called D uh, SourceD, located in Spain. They've gone out of business. They built it in order to write queries against GitHub repos. Uh, so they, they built it as this general purpose SQL query engine where to integrate with it, you define a bunch of Golang interfaces. So a SQL.database, tells the engine, these are the tables that I have. A SQL.table gives the engine a way to access the rows in your table. And then there's a bunch of other interfaces you can implement to unlock additional functionality. In principle, this works with any data source, right? So we've defined these interfaces in terms of Dolt, but there's nothing Dolt specific about the engine at this point. At this point, it's, it's a general query execution engine. Uh, it provides a parser, so it's got a parser that that's tries to parse the MySQL dialect uh, completely accurately. It has a query analyzer to come up with a query plan to figure out how to execute the, the query and an optimizer to make it faster. And then it also provides a server. So that, that, this is what powers the, the, both the Dolt SQL shell as well, well, well as the Dolt SQL server that lets anybody, that, anything that talks MySQL binary to connect to this thing and talk to it out of the box. Uh, we test this thing against SQL logic test. SQL logic test is a test suite that was developed by SQLite 3 when they were uh, first getting started. They, these are the people that kind of hit upon the idea uh, of just writing millions and millions of templated queries that they then run against a known good database product like InnoDB, like Postgres, and then just compare the results, right? They're, they're basically offloading their testing burden to InnoDB and, and MySQL, and we did the same thing. Uh, so when we got to this thing, it had about 20% correctness. It only passed about 20% of the SQL logic test suite. We've, since, we've since raised that number to about 92%, uh, and we're, we continue to get small gains. Of course, there's, there's a long way to go. As everyone knows, the, the last 90% of the work is in the last 10% of the, of the correctness. So we're getting there. Um, so uh, so two, two quick things. One is, yeah. it's, it's not, they're not SQL like people. It's one dude, it's Richard. It's only one guy writing SQLite, and he's awesome. Okay, <laughs> thanks. The optimizer, um, is that a cost-based optimizer, or is it, is it purely based on heuristics? It's not even based on heuristics. It's way more primitive than that. We hope to one day get to a heuristic optimizer, and from there, a cost-based optimizer. To have a cost-based optimizer, you have to be able to understand the statistics yes. on the table, right? You have to understand the, the key cardinality and distribution. We don't have any of that yet. Uh, literally the kind of things we're talking about here is instead of doing a cross join when you merge two tables together, yeah, yeah. we're going to convert one of them to an index lookup. That's the kind okay. of optimization we're talking about, right? It's, it's, so it's very, very, it's very primitive, very long way to go. I mean, that's what everyone builds the first time. It's not a surprise. So, but like, that's important, right? Because unless you're going to show me additional use cases, but like, if you want people to use the adult, if you want people to play in the adult ecosystem and use the adult, uh, the SQL interface or go through GDBC to connect to you. Like, this is not something you'd want to be doing, uh, you know, transactions on, right? This is, this is for data analytics and the thing that Oscar should be giving yep. all data analysis. But now, if, you're, if you, you don't have a cost-based optimizer, why would I ever want to run complex analytics using Dole when I want to dump your data out of your thing, put it now into Postgres SQL Server or something else, and then then I make changes and now have to shuttle it back into, into Dolt, right? Yeah, this is, this, this is a great point. You're 100% you're correct. We have a long way to go on performance to, to be able to satisfy the use case you're talking about. For the time being, Dolt works best for what we call kind of call human scale data, right? Thousands, but not millions of entries. The kind of thing where if, if I do have a complicated diff, a single human can sit down and review the entire thing right? Yep. Uh, to be able to scale up to usefulness for millions of or billions of rows, we have a long way to come on performance. You're 100% right. Okay. Um, and, 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 and in the short term, we, we do anticipate that people who have the, the analytic heavy workloads will offload all that analysis to a faster, more performance system, something like Postgres or maybe even Bigtable. 
uh, or BigQuery, and we're we're working on tools that that make that kind of interchange kind of uh, foolproof and and easy to do. Right now, right now, wherever you see a CSV shared on the internet, like on GitHub, this, Dolt is better. Wherever you see an API, Dolt is better. Over time, if we can get a foothold in those use cases, we will get better and better at traditional database use cases. But those, but APIs and CSVs on the internet are a terrible solution for sharing data between human beings. Absolutely, yeah. Well, hey, this is, the, this is the, the, the classic maneuver Tim's using here, which is, yes, we're terrible, but we're not nearly as terrible as the thing that we're trying to replace, right? So we're still, we're still a huge step forward in the, in the right direction, but you're 100% you're right that we have, a, we have a long way to go for performance for, uh, we plan to, to get there. We're about four times slower than MySQL. Yeah. Prop, and, there, there, and there's probably use cases you could find where we're doing worse than four than four X, but that that's a, a pretty good. On average. Yeah, on average. Uh, so that's go MySQL Server. Um, if you want to check it out, uh, please do. Like I said, we just adopted this from an organization that went bankrupt. Uh, we're very interested in in having people collaborate with us and and improve it. Uh, we are using it for Dolt, but it it is a general purpose engine that anybody who has data that can be exposed to can benefit from helping us make better. So if that sounds like something interesting to you, uh, please check it out. It's on it's on GitHub. Uh, uh, one other one other shout out. There's another open source SQL engine which does something similar. It's called Octo SQL. Uh, it builds itself as a way to connect any two data sources together. You can give it CSVs and Postgres databases and whatever else, and it'll let you run queries on them. We're trying to the we're, we're, Go MySQL Server is notable in that a it provides a a SQL Server interface that you can connect to, which is actually really valuable, and b because it's a read write interface. Octo SQL is is read only. So it's useful if you're if you're just doing reads, but if you want if you want a full featured engine that lets you do updates, inserts, uh, et cetera, then you really have to do something with what we're doing. So we started at the top of the architecture diagram. Now we're going to dive way back down to the bottom and talk about the byte store itself. Uh, the byte store we we have for Dolt is based on NOMS, which was another open source uh, graph database product. Uh, Dolt is Git for data. But the thing, the the objects out of which the git commit graph is built are tables, whereas the original noms database was itself a graph database, uh, which means it doesn't have any notion of tables. It doesn't have any notion of schema. You can't run SQL on it. You have to run GraphQL. So it's not it, it's not a uh, native. It's it's not a data format that can be easily queried by someone who's used to working with CSVs or Excel spreadsheets. You really have to write a program to efficiently query a noms graph. Uh, what we've done is, is built these table and column and index semantics on top of this graph database in order to make it workable and compatible with the rest of the SQL world. What's special about noms is that it's a content address data store so that every value can be uh, retrieved by its cryptographic hash. Uh, in terms of storage, it's kind of split into two parts. You've got uh, a bunch of raw byte files that are just split into chunks, and they just sit in a directory somewhere. And then you have an index structure, which uh, noms calls a table file, that provides an index lookup from the hashes of these objects to where you can find them in the files and the offsets in the files. Pretty straightforward. Uh, the, the way noms stores data is like a Merkle DAG in that it's a B tree like structure where the nodes, both the leaves, the intermediates and the roots are all content addressable. Uh, content addressable is, is important for when you're building a product that's like Git, because it means that if you, when you're comparing two trees for the, for their contents, if you find a node that have that there are two nodes in the, in the two trees that have the same hash, you know that those nodes are identical, both their contents and recursively all their children's contents. Uh, I'm going to dive into a little bit about the structure called a proly tree, which is how we get the structural sharing across revisions. We think it's pretty interesting. So the, the proly tree is, is kind of the magic sauce that makes noms interesting and makes Dolt, our get for data solution, possible and makes it makes our AWS storage costs not balloon as much as you might think they might. So a proly tree is like a B tree, but it's better for content addressing. Uh, so there, there's nothing stopping you from taking a existing B tree and just making it content addressable, that's pretty easy to do. The, the problem is when you do that, you're, you're gonna blow up the storage because the B tree is relatively inflexible in how they're, how they're built. So a proly tree 
it, it stores all its key value data in the leaf nodes, just like a B tree. Uh, it's got internal nodes that have key delimiters and child pointers, just like a B tree. Uh, the difference is that the leaf nodes and the internal nodes are all variable length and content addressed. And this is, this is an important aspect for how we get the structural sharing and avoid blowing up our AWS bill. Unlike B trees, the child pointers to internal nodes and leaf nodes aren't pointers, they're not memory addresses, they are content addresses, which are referred to by their hash, uh, and then they can live anywhere on disk. You just follow, follow where, they, where they live based on the index. Uh, the, the, the last point here is, is the one that is really important for, for our purposes, is that unlike a content address B tree, small insertions or mutations typically don't require rewriting large parts of the tree. Typically, you only have to edit one block and its immediate ancestors in the tree. You don't have to edit any siblings. And we'll, we'll examine why that's the case. OK, so diagram time. This is kind of the interesting slide in the talk. On the top, we have a B tree. This should look familiar to everyone in the audience. Uh, this is, represents a root node and three intermediate nodes. Child values, or the actual leaf nodes, are omitted. These are just the, the root and intermediate nodes. So you can see we've got, uh, we've got a root and three pointer or three children for each of these trees. On the bottom, we see a probably tree. So these two trees store the same information. If you look, you'll see that the 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 lower level they both store the value one, two, five, six, nine, twelve, eighteen, twenty one, but they're storing them in slightly different ways. Uh, the other the, the the two things which should jump out to you are one the the hash values associated. So instead of following memory pointers or uh, direct file-based offset pointers to find the children of a node, we're getting this hash and following that through an index to where it lives on disk. So uh, in, every, in every node, both the root and the intermediate nodes, all the children are referred to by their, their hash values. Follow that hash, you find the child. The second thing which should stand out to you is that the nodes are all variable length. Uh, if you look up at the B tree, this is a, a, a four-way B tree, so every, every node has four children. And if you look down at the bottom, every node has a variable number of, of children. The root has three. The, the one on the bottom left there has one child and so on. They have a maximum, but they, they, they can actually have fewer than the max, fewer than the, the chunk size can fit. Uh, and this is important for the structural sharing. Wait, so for the, the, the hash lookup, maybe that's the next slide. Maybe, like, there's another, there's a hash table like, that maps the hash to, to their, their, their location on disk. That's right. There, there's th this. This is the second important piece. Is outside of the the tree structure and the the raw byte storage itself. Is we have an index, which everything that is content addressable in the database has a direct lookup to where you can find it on disk. And what what is that data structure? Uh, Noms calls this a table file, but it's ba it's basically just a just a hash map. You have a okay. you you take you, you take the the cryptographic hash of the node and you follow it to where it lives on disk. What, what kind of hash table? That's a good question. Let's let's come back at that to the end. There's a couple other uh, engineers from Liquidate on here who are probably better equipped to answer that than I am. It's not, I'm um, just curious. It's, it's, a, it's a long standing issue of which hash able to use. I'm just curious. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll 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 come back to that at the end if we have time. Uh, so let let's look at how we build a probably tree um, and talk about why it actually gives us some of the nice structural sharing and avoids killing our AWS bill. So unlike a standard B tree, the the chunks in a probably tree are determined or probabilistically sized. They don't, they're not all the same size. What you put in each one and how full it gets is a function of a probabilistic rolling hash. So if you look down at the bottom diagram, we have kind of two parallel rows on the top is a hash and on the bottom is the content. And the way we build up our probably tree is by inserting the elements on the bottom and computing a rolling hash of the contents of that chunk so far. And we have a rule. The rule is whenever the hash, our, our rolling hash value so far falls below a threshold, then we stop that chunk and start a new one. So for this example, we've chosen the hash of 10. In reality, you choose this by, by doing some math to figure out what average chunk size you want to get based on the size of your, uh, of your hash. Uh, and this, you, you don't know exactly, uh, you don't know ahead of time how big each chunk is going to be, but on, you, know, you know over time what the average chunk size will turn out in, in the long run. So as we feed these values in, one, two, five, six, seven, nine, you can see that whenever the rolling hash falls below that threshold, we draw that vertical line and start a new chunk boundary. So here, we, we, this gives us blocks of one value, four value, and three value, which 
match the intermediate nodes we see in the probably tree here. Okay, so these these blocks aren't as full as they could have been. We've probabilistically left some space in there uh, for a very important reason. Uh, Let's talk about some of the advantages of the probably tree over a content address B tree. The, this first one is a big one, structural sharing. The small changes that we typically make in a, in a you know, small set of updates, we're inserting a few new rows, we're editing about the value in a third of the rows, are usually limited to a single chunk. So you have to rewrite that chunk and you have to rewrite all of its ancestors in the tree back up to the root, but you're typically not overflowing those nodes into their siblings and having to rewrite all of those siblings and their ancestors back all the way up to the root. Of course, you have the trust and verification where, where if you, because it's a cryptographic hash, if you, if, if the hashes of two nodes match, you know that the, the those parts of the tree are in fact identical. Uh, and this makes it efficient to recursively diff two trees, which is important when we're syncing two trees uh, from a remote repository to a local repository. If the content addresses of the two nodes are different, then we know we have to recurse and figure out what's different there. If they're the same, we can just stop and we know that that part of the tree hasn't changed. So it's efficient to synchronize, efficient to diff these data structures. There's a, here's an illustration uh, about how the structural sharing comes out in kind of the best case. Uh, the, the top left here, you can see where you've added a single new chunk to the database. The new chunk is represented in blue, the old chunks are represented in, in gray. Uh, when I when I overwrite that chunk in the middle with blue, I'm changing the ancestors all the way back up to the root, but none of the siblings typically need to be rewritten because we left some space probabilistically for new changes to come in. Uh, this is true not only when adding a, a single new chunk in the middle, but also a run of chunks in the middle or at the beginning or at the end. Uh, and again, this is probabilistic, so you, we're, we're, we can only talk about this stochastically, but on average, when you when you do these kinds of modifications, you don't suffer any spillover into adjacent sibling, uh, sibling chunks, which means you don't have to rewrite the entire table. Looks like Andy has a question. I, I'm picking up the dog, sorry. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Uh, any, any questions? So th th this kind of concludes the section about the base layer uh, byte storage that we use. I'm going to move on next to talk about how Dolt is built on top of this in terms of how we define the columns and rows and so on. Then any questions before we move forward? I think we're short on time, so I, I would jump to the, the next part. Great. So uh, just one quick question on the last one, sorry. Yeah. So if you uh, hey, 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 have to say who you are. Oh, I'm sorry. My name's Anthony Tomasic. Uh, I'm a database guy too. Um, uh, but I have gray hair, I'm, I'm unlike Andy. Uh, and if you insert at the beginning of a file here, such oh. that all the bytes are sort of shifted down, does this still apply, the structural sharing? It, it, it applies on average, right? Um, so on average, we don't fill up all these chunks as full as they could possibly go. We, we, cho we, choose, a, we, we choose a threshold for this probabilistic rolling hash that leaves enough space on average that we don't need to do that. Um, you can, of course, come up with antagonistic insert sequences that, that really abuse this thing and cause the storage to blow up. Uh, but it's optimized for, on average, not spilling over into sibling nodes most of the time. Right, thank you. Yep. So let's talk about how we use this to implement Dolt. Uh, what we've talked about so far is, is really raw byte storage, how these things are stored on disks and accessed. Uh, but like I said in the beginning, NOMS is not a, a relational database. It's a graph database. It doesn't understand rows, doesn't know what a table is, doesn't know what a schema is. We built all that on top of NOMS. Um, and this, th this next set of slides explains how. So an adult, adult repository, uh, if you dig around on the dot directory on disk, you can find these things uh, sitting in a little JSON file. But we store a bunch of pointers into this object storage cloud that is NOMS. Uh, specifically the head, the working sets, and the staged, all the branch refs you have defined. These are terms that should be familiar to you if you've, if you've worked with Git. It's, they follow the, exactly the same function here. You have a working set, which is the stuff that you've checked out but not necessarily committed. It may or may not be the same as head. It may or may not be the same as staged. But regardless, it's a pointer into a to a data structure that lives somewhere inside this object storage cloud. If we dig into these clouds and follow some of these hashes to the values that they represent, uh, you find that there are these things called root values. A root value is how Dolt defines the top-level database object. Uh, 
uh, again, the, the, these, are, these are the things that we, we need to represent in order to build table and column and schema semantics on top of the graph database that is noms. So we define, for example, a set of tables, uh, some foreign keys, some other bookkeeping that we need to keep track of, of things in the database and, and make it make queries efficient and so on. If we follow one of these table references, we find that this is a map that maps table names to table values. Uh, pay attention to the, the, the long nonsensical hash strings at the top of each of these. I'm trying to represent the fact that in each case, these are content addressed hash references that we then follow using the, the same mechanism we talked about in the, the prior part of my talk. Uh, we're just following, you, you can think of it exactly like following a pointer, except it goes through this uh, indexed intermediary to figure out where on disk these things live. So the root value has these tables. The tables point via this indirect content address half pointer into these table struct values. The table struct values themselves go further into the object cloud with more hash child references. Uh, they define a schema, which is basically you know, what, what columns are on this table, what properties do these columns have, such as their type, their nullability, all the things you'd expect from a relational database. It defines a pointer into a map of table data, which we'll get to shortly. And then things like conflicts on that table, uh, which is kind of a temporary holding cell for any conflicts which might exist as a result of a merge, uh, the indexes which are defined on, on that table, all the kind of stuff you might, you might expect from a relational database. And here we're at the, the bottom layer. This is the, data, the table data that Dolt actually stores at the, the end of the day. So uh, pay attention first to the, the, bottom, the bottom part of the slide, the, the map structure here. So table rows are in Dolt are represented of a map of tuple to tuple. The tuples always are even length because they are pairs of tag number and value. So if you look at the top half of the slide, you can see that each of the three columns in this example table have a tag number associated with them. ID has tag three, first name tag 10, last name tag four. The reason we associate column values with these tag numbers uh, instead of just the name of the column is so that things like column renames work transparently and don't cause us to change any storage. It becomes a schema only op operation rather than a data changing operation. But if you, if you look at the, the top, table and the, the bottom map, these should look very similar. In each case, we're simply enumerating the tag of a column followed by the value that column has for that row. So every row in the table is an entry in the map. Every key column in the table is an entry in the key of the tuple. Every non-key column is an entry in, uh, in the value tuple. Uh, if, if you'll notice the ID or tag ID three, uh, only has a first name, there's no last name there. Uh, in that case, we just don't store a value for that tuple. Pretty straightforward. Uh, I think this is the last slide. So this, uh, uh, thanks, for, thanks for listening so far. Uh, anybody who's held off with a question, we can run through those until we're out of time. Yeah, uh, just another question. Um, so if I understand the structure right, all the metadata is automatically versioned also. That's correct. So any kind of, because you're, you're completely blending the data and the metadata into this, uh, rep, you know, Git repository, so to speak. That's is right. That so correct? The, that's right. So the, if you look at this, this slide here with the, with the table structs, these are the objects which are actually, right, right. that we're storing in the physical uh, graph database right, that we right. built, built on top of. Right, so the, the one thing I don't get is how I use this. So here's a typical thing I do with data integration. I'll have a table and uh, you know, I'll run a cleaning operation on one of the columns. And then I'll take that output and dump it into some temporary table because I know I'm about ready to do something else with that. So do I like check out the table and then execute the SQL and insert it as a new transaction? As part of that batch checkout, and then commit that uh, table. Is that how it works? You missed the demo in the beginning. Oh, I'm, I yeah. apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. It's uh, no, don't, don't don't be sorry. Um, this is this is excellent for people who are following along at home or viewing later. Uh, the so you think of a adult database as a Git repo, right? So just like you wouldn't check out a particular file with Git, you check out the entire repo. The same logic applies here. So I check out my repo. 
I make whatever edits that I that I want to. I examine if they are correct or not by running dolt diff. That gives me kind of a, a summary view of what's changed. And if I'm happy with it, then I add the tables that I want to commit and then type dolt commit and that commits a, a new revision of the of the database, right? Uh, if you want to do this on a branch, you type get checkout or dolt checkout beforehand to start working on a branch, and then you can send that off for a pull request review uh, or merge it back in. Right. Any, any of the Git workflows you're used to translate pretty naturally. Um, you th you did just think of, instead of working with files, you're working with tables that are versioned. Yeah, I understand entirely. Thank you. Yep. OK, so uh, this is normally when, when we, we would applaud if, if we were on campus. So we, so we can't do that. So I'll, I'll applaud for everyone. <laughs> uh, is anybody, we have time for maybe one more question before I ask, or ask the, my question. Uh, <laughs> if anybody else wants, wants, to, wants to go at it, go for it. Okay, so the, the, the proly tree is based on the primary key, correct? The, no, the, the, the proly tree is, is content addressed, right? So it's, the, it's, it's, it's a hash of the bytes that are actually stored on disk. Okay, so it's- key, key and primary key as well as uh, the rest of the, the content of the, of the row. Okay, so how, so if, if I want to declare if I want to declare like a secondary index, mm -hmm. how would that work here? Because if it's if it's versioned, like so, mm -hmm. if I make a change to a row, I you you add a new little entry here. But now if I'm updating a secondary index, that mm -hmm. corresponds to another thing that gets changed. Is that just treated as a second like another? Because an, another one update to one two will causes multiple changes to to the secondary indexes. Yeah, that's exactly right. So if you so if you look at this this diagram, you'll note that the the indexes of a table point off into another map of tuple yeah. to tuple, right? Um, we we've essentially done exactly the same thing, uh, except we we so we duplicate uh, some of the storage of the table, uh, and we we key it on a different value, right? The set of the set of columns you select for that secondary index, and then like in most databases, uh, when you when you do a write, the cost of it is going to be proportional to how many indexes you've declared. Got it. Okay, but then so I think to go back to, to the next slide. Um, yep. This thing here. There's nothing about your your tuple uh, on the value pair of your map that says you actually have to store that as a row store. Um, but you uh, now because you'd have to maintain a separate and you have to maintain no no sorry if your if your cache to location map was actually a offset within the column, then mm -hmm. you could, could compute where those columns could appear, and then you could actually store this physically as a column store, which would give you all the benefits you would want to, if you want to do analytics or compression and things like that. Yes, uh, this, is, this is something we talked about a lot kind of in the, the early design phase, um, and it, it's a trade-off, right? It's um, it's, it's, from an engineering standpoint, it's harder. It's it's a little it's a little harder, but it it also has a different set of trade offs. So we we mentioned at the beginning, Oscar ran that diff and it had a giant spew of output, and you said, why is this so wide? Um, this is a concern. It's not a concern for the output and being able to analyze it, but also because it does increase storage costs. Um, so if, if, you, if you look at the the rows in this map, the the addressable unit for being able to be versioned is the row, right? So if I so if I make a change to one of these values. I'm duplicating the storage for all the other values in that row too, yeah. right? And, you, and, and like, like you said, uh, it's, it's simple enough to imagine ways around this. Uh, we could have column families, for example, that would allow us to separately version some of the columns on a table. And these are things we've, we've talked about, but uh, in terms of the, the engineering trade-offs as well as uh, uh, what they would do to some of the, the algorithms we're trying to run, we, we decided to go with, with row major exclusively for now. Um, and we'll probably return to that as, as customers ask, ask for more. Okay. And then, last two questions, sorry, because again, this is, this is way different than everything else. Um, yep. Garbage collection is all manual or like... like someone garbage, has a garbage collection is non-existent right now. Um, okay. There's the, the amount of garbage generated by uh, this process is, can be relatively large for a local version. But the nature of walking the tree starting from the root and pushing it to a remote source kind of naturally 
cleans up any anything that doesn't have an active reference pointing to it, right? Okay. So when you're when you're when you're running SQL commands and updating stuff on disk, and then you finally make up your mind and say, "This is what I'm going to commit and push it to to master," you might leave a lot of stuff, kind of inter intermediate representations on disk that don't that aren't referenced by any commit, and those are garbage. Uh, we don't have a way currently to clean those up, but the the process of pushing it to the remote does that naturally. So somebody else who clones that data set will only get you know the, the the bare minimum of data pulled down, and this happens as a matter of course just because of the algorithms involved. Okay, I'm just to, um, sorry. Can I interject? Uh, it seems uh, Puya uh, from Sydney, hi Puya, does not have a mic but has a oh. question. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh. that, that question is uh, about concurrent access to DOL and how it works. And uh, I'm not surprised. I'm going to hand this one to Zach. <laughs> yeah. So the, the 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 short answer is it doesn't work. Uh, we're it, it's possible to run Dolt concurrently, but it doesn't it doesn't work the way that a normal application server would. You can't run you know, dozens of concurrent connections, all issuing updates and writes and expect things to, to function. And in fact, when you connect to Dolt with, with the, through the SQL server, we currently limit you to a single concurrent connection unless you trigger, unless you uh, give a special flag at the command line that says, I really know what I'm doing, I know what I want. Uh, the, the way that you work with multiple concurrent users currently is uh, kind of with an analog to get detached head, um, where you're not updating the working set, everybody's working on their own head, and then if you want to merge those changes back to the working set, you have to do so explicitly with a set of special SQL commands or from the command line. Uh, over time, we do, we do want to add support for, for concurrent interaction. And we're currently debating exactly what that looks like and how it'll work and how to keep people from stepping on each other's toes. Okay, that's a good question. Um, the, all right, so we're way over time, so I apologize. If, if people have to go, they go. Um, Oh, now on Dolt Hub, are you storing it as a bunch of EBS files? Are you smart about saying shoving things off to S3 to save money? Mm -hmm. Is there any strategy there? Or that's just you haven't you haven't gotten there yet. Uh, that's a great question. Everything is stored in S3. Okay. Uh, yeah. And and in fact, if you if you go to Dolt Hub and browse a repository, it's pulling data directly from S3. It's not doing any sort of intermediate caching, except in memory on whatever service host you happen to hit. Yep. Um, and this this works surprisingly well. It turns out if you do some intelligent pre-fetching of things that you know you're likely to access, you can avoid all the round trips that would that would cause the performance to be really bad. Uh, one, okay. one, uh, so it's not all S3. It does use uh, Dynamo. Brian, can you speak up? It's hard to hear you. Sorry. It, it does use Dynamo as well, in addition to S3. As a so. caching layer? Uh, it uses it to store something uh, called manifest, which is yeah, this is yeah. a list of all the table files. But then additionally, I believe some, of, in some cases, it will store some chunk files in there as an authorization. Okay. Just, to be, just to be clear, uh, Brian is a co-founder and senior engineer at Liquidator. So he has intimate experience with Yeah, he's not, he's not a rando. <laughs> yes, I, I assume so, yes. Um, I, my last question is, Noms got you the got you you know from like you can build off Noms and you can get the MVP up and running pretty quickly. I wonder if you had to build it from scratch if you if you if you're building based on on MVCC system that you could not just use the deltas for M, that you generate when you're doing transactions under MVCC and that just just becomes the the sort of the atomic unit of, of a diff. Right, so like, because if now if you want to add transactions, you, I mean, you could do two phase locking, but it, this is it's essentially is a single version system. Uh, is that true? Yeah, within yeah. this within a connection. Um, yes, I mean there, there there there's lots of ways we we can address it. Uh, yeah. the, the, I I think the the simplest answer to your question of like why didn't we just use you know row, row based diff semantics. Uh, is that it doesn't give us a commit graph. Um, we we kind of started with the assumption that the Git model was actually vital for what we're trying to do, um, and we're we're coming at this with a with a mission not primarily of building a performant database server, but of making data collaboration and exchange possible. Right. 
Um, and with with that primary goal in mind, we we, we decided that the, the git commit graph, branch and merge, clone and fork, those were all indispensable. And you can't really get that from from just just the diff of rows. You do need a an actual commit graph. And to, to, to Zach's point, if you recall the mapping tables example, right, we're taking third party data, writing it into our database, yeah. then transforming that data to produce derived data and so on and so forth, right? And in, in the implicit value proposition is that there is this underlying data graph and you can roll back and dip and merge. And like without that, I don't, it, it doesn't, you know, that, that's kind of the core of what we're trying to achieve, right? It's, like, it's, yeah, it's, it's much more, sorry, this is Anthony, it's much more uh, scientific workflows than it is, yeah, yeah. you know, versioning of transactions yeah. to hide, you know, yeah, latencies. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's why I had to, yeah, correct. The reality is, is without this, you can't merge two arbitrary copies of the database, right? If you do the other way, you can get good diff, but you can't, merges become really uh, like, our, like unbounded, unboundedly complex. And, it, and sort of the concrete use case, I think, for merges, right, is if you're subscribing to an upstream data set and you're using it in a business process and you have a set of local overrides, Right, this is a, a really like bedeviling complexity in reality, right? And you can actually maintain your own set and then merge in updates. So you continue to subscribe to updates from an upstream data source while having your own local customizations without writing any custom application code. And this is like yeah. radically yeah. different yeah. models. Like you, you, you're dealing at the, the higher level, like the logical level. You could still do that physically different ways. All right, we are like 15 minutes over time. I have to help my wife. I, there's a whole other topic about like how do you actually then allow people to monetize data on Dolt Hub. I'm sure you guys have thought about that. Like that's a whole other awesome thing. Um, mm -hmm. So I I want to give props actually actually to Puya from from being what it's what Sydney was 5 a.m. So that's oh, the power. That's commitment. That's awesome. What's that? That's commitment. <laughs> that's commitment to databases. That's awesome. So, yeah. All right. Uh, we thank Oscar uh, and, and Zach and our friends at uh, Dove Hub for being with us uh, today.